Well, good morning, everybody. Worship team, we needed that hymn, especially today, summer and winter and springtime and harvest. We needed to be reminded that God is still faithful. Welcome to everyone joining us online. If you chose to worship with us outside the state of Indiana, you made a very good decision today. So, but we're grateful that you're here, trusting spring will come. Jesus is still on the throne, preaching about hope and joy today, confidence in God. No, just kidding, but just welcome. Glad you're here. Lent season, week two. What's our theme for our Lent season? One day, right? Did you see the one day wall when you came in? There are all these prayer cards posted out there. If you haven't yet participated, be thinking about what you want to write on your one day prayer card. We're believing God for some big things to be answered. We're believing him for breakthroughs. And did you notice some cards started to flip already? So as God answers the prayer on the wall, flip your card over, and hopefully that will continue to breathe life and encouragement and faith and trust that God can and will come through. So that's what the series is about. It's based on Acts 10, where Cornelius worked the muscles of praying continually. And then, so at 10.02 every day, I guess a bunch of phones probably already went off at 10.02. So 10.02, we pray each day that we're working the muscles of believing God for these, and then 10.03 is going to come at some point, right? One day, like with Cornelius, God sent an angel at 3 o'clock in the afternoon to break through. Maybe that today, any old ordinary day can become a one day. One of the things we want to do through the series is talk about one-day stories, kind of set some one-day stories before you, not only during this Lent season, but I suspect it's going to trickle on past that as God breaks through and breaks in. So I would like you to put your hands together and welcome to the stage Jana Lange Bartles and her brother Kyle Whiteley. Morning, guys. So if if you've been around Eagle for any length of time, you know that pretty much there's a good percentage of people in the congregation related to one connection of these family units. So either the Lange Bartle contingency, whom Jana married into, or the Whiteley contingency. So we got brother and sister up here. And Jana, when I first started talking about one day, tell me something, just tell the folks, like, you sensed a nudging from God when we started talking about what this series was going to be about and how the Lord was stirring in you, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, even before the one day series has started, I just felt like the Lord was asking me to take a step of obedience and just that I had a role to be vulnerable. Um, but then when we brought up the one day series, I'm sure many of us have more than one one day moment as do I, but the Lord uses this one specifically just to remind me of his like faithfulness and goodness and love for me. So I'd love for you guys jumping into the story. Just talk about the environment with which you were raised. It was a great environment. So many things to be thankful for. So between the two of you, I thought you'd kind of represent kind of upbringing years. Yeah. Well, we grew up on a farm just outside of Thorntown. Um, it's a great childhood, loving mother and father. We went to church three times a week. Wow. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday evening service. And um, we were indoctrinated with a lot of the Bible, you know, taught the Bible. And um, it's a good childhood. You grew up in a really faith-filled environment, though, mm-hmm. I think you both say, right? Jana, when you think about your upbringing, what stands out to you from the childhood years in your home front? We went to church a lot. <laughs> um, Where's mom? Mom's here somewhere, right? So, Sherry, way to go. Had him in church. When yeah. the church doors were open, you the guys Bibles were there. The Bibles were open in the kitchen, you know. Mm-hmm. They were faithful and prayerful, I believe, for all of us kids. That's good. Yet, in the midst of that environment, Jana... There were some struggles as a young girl, right? Yeah. Can you give us a, some windows into, as a young girl growing up, though the home environment was great mm-hmm. and your parents were faithful and prayerful and they had you around church, you as a young girl were, were struggling. Yeah. Sorry, y'all. I, ha- I took notes, so I'm going to be looking at my paper a little bit too. But um, I do specific- specifically remember in fifth grade just seeing other girls and kind of wishing that I could be them. Not like horror movie where you like cut off their skin and wear it be them but like (laughs) I just was never sorry I just wanted to be something other than who I was created to be Mm. so at the start of every semester if I had a new teacher I would decided I wanted to be the shy person in class which lasted 30 minutes because I like to talk I like to joke I laugh when people fall down before knowing that they're okay I just (laughs) there was just a lack of self-value Um, I knew the stories of the Lord. I went to camps and conferences. I rededicated my life three or more times. Um, 
I do wish I was able to understand how to translate the emotion I would feel at those camps to an active daily life with Jesus as a young person. Mm. And Kyle, were you aware as a brother, like your sister growing up, did you have any kind of context to this? Clueless. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I was, what, four, five years older, like grade-wise, so her fifth grade year, I would have been a sophomore in high school, and I was pretty self-absorbed, and as most teenagers are, and <laughs> I, teens, I did I honestly had, had no clue that yeah. she was going through okay. what she was. And so then high school, right? So mm-hmm. you, you, you work through your high school years, right? Come to the graduation moment, mm-hmm. and that becomes a big transition in your story, yeah. right? Yep. Jana, you want to talk about, as you were moving from the high school graduation, envisioning next chapter of your life, where the story went there? Yeah. So at the end of my senior year, I moved to Indy to attend IUPUI. Um, I can't fully explain the why trajectory that my life took. I think at some point I just chose to toss out my moral compass. Mm. Um, What I know about myself now in the world is that I'm a daughter of the high king and that the enemy is real and lurking and ready to attack and has every desire to knock me out of the race. Um, What I knew then were that there are powers beyond me. Um, I didn't quite know how to approach the Lord and only a slight understanding of spiritual warfare. Mm. I felt a longing and need for attention and love and to be sought after all really good things. Um, I just attempted to fill that natural desire with drugs and boys and overall just a really messy lifestyle. Mm. Um, I dug myself into a deep financial hole within the first few months. I was driving around one day just chatting about money and the lack thereof, and I noticed a gentleman's club. Um, I can't fully explain why I thought working there was wise, um, but in my heart, I believe that a desperation for money and a lack of value I saw in myself caused me not to even flinch. Hmm. It was days or weeks, this time frame gets kind of blurry, but um, when my parents came banging down on the apartment door, just like any good parent would do, um, because a friend of the family happened to catch me there. They packed up all my things and moved me home only a few months after I had originally left. I felt like an embarrassment to my family that I would forever be branded with whatever labels our small community decided to place on me. Um, That identity of shame led to a disconnection, and I really struggled to recover from being under that cloud. Hmm. Kyle, you want to jump in here and just talk, like, your relationship with Jana through these years and your perspective, like, what you saw going on, um, just, there was an awful lot she covered there. Mm -hmm. And obviously for your family front, there was a lot going on and maybe your, your perspective from the older brother here. Yeah, I think, um, like I said, initially I was pretty clueless. And even, even as she moved through high school and, and beyond, um, I didn't really know anything um, was going on with her until after mom and dad, you know, had brought her home. Yeah. And, um, I didn't really know, like from, you know, with the age gap that we have and at that, in those points in our lives, we were just in very different places. So, um, again, I didn't know how to um, necessarily reach out and and be there for. And I think that kind of that kind of haunted me because Mm. um, I could have been a resource, um, you know, yeah. just an ear to listen, and I, I don't, right. I don't believe that I was. Um, but again, I, I didn't know that s- some of the deep down struggles that she was having. I just kind of thought she was off the rails, <laughs> and yeah. you know, if I'd have known, I think if I'd have known more of the struggle inside, um, maybe I've reacted differently. But yeah. that's definitely a regret that I have. So you go from you work in this gentleman's club. Your parents come pull you out of that environment, basically say you're coming home. Yeah. Right, they just say, we got to bring you back, get you under their, their roof again, kind of try to hit the reset button again. So pick up the story from there. What happens now at this stage and what comes next? Um, I ended up running away that following Easter Sunday, months after you I had Easter? come. Easter? Yeah, because I knew they would all be at church. <laughs> <laughs> so they're at church. Yes. You take off. Yep, just running back to old patterns. Um, So I ended up moving to Florida months later, and I found myself eating pineapple out of a can on Thanksgiving, and it was just 
for some reason, that became a low point because I was hungry. And I just felt like the Lord was asking me kind of just, aren't you tired? Mm. Um, so I called Kyle. I don't know why. I, I mean, I love you. I don't know why I chose Kyle specifically, <laughs> you know, particularly. I had, but been, I had always been there for you. Yeah, you have. You. <laughs> He'd been so connected and aware of all that was going on. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> but I did, and he answered, and I just asked him if he would come get me, and he asked me if I would change my life, and I said yes, whether I had any intention of changing my life at that point, I don't know. But Well, and I'll interject here. I have no recollection of asking you if you would change your life in that phone call. Yeah. In my memory, it was, <laughs> will you come get me? Well, yes, of course, I'll <laughs> come get you. <laughs> Yeah. But that part stands out to me just because I feel yeah. like my yes was, whether I meant it or not, I think it was a stake in the ground of a turning point. Some, but wow. So he drove down that night from Indy and picked me up the next day, packed up my things, took me to Taco Bell. <laughs> Classy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> she was hungry. <laughs> she was hungry. Was. Pineapple in a can to Taco Bell. I was. And, and he drove me home. So, Kyle, talk about that phone call. Just, yeah. you know, just... Give us a little inside look to what's going on in you as a bigger brother, and obviously you're getting a deeper dive into what's going on on a phone call like that. And well, I think that was the first time that it really clicked that mm. that she was hurting, you know, that it was more than just she was choosing a lifestyle. It was more that I finally realized that she was scared, mm. she was hurting, and she needed me, and it was finally a chance to be there for her and we were trying to figure out when what exact when that date was sometime between Thanksgiving and Christmas I had only been married a month and a half and I had you know I had a young wife and um, you know we had a brief conversation Megan and I did and she's like you need to go and so to have I mean to have her encouragement yeah uh, if she hadn't said that I you know who knows? But we both just sensed, yeah, I need to go. So I called my boss and said, I need to, a couple of days off work. And, and you literally just loaded, loaded up the, in the car. Yeah, I just got in the car. I don't even think I packed a bag. I think I just got in the car and went. Wow. So I thought about Luke 15 when I heard this part of the story. You know, there's just such a great picture of the father's heart, you know, the way you represented Luke 15 when the prodigal's out in a distant country, you know, and you just, your immediate response was, Jana calls and says, Kyle, will you come? And in your heart, yes, you know, like, I'll come. And uh, it's such a great image of, of God's heart for us and that. So give us age. Now, how old are you at this point in the story? Uh, 19. 19. What did Florida represent as you look back on it? Like, you go, I look back at it. What did, like, going to Florida, what in your heart was just, just running, just getting away? Right. Confusion, probably. Okay. Yeah. Running. I don't know. I don't know. And then you come back. Kyle loads you up, gives you Taco Bell, right? And then you land back in Indiana, Mm -hmm. right? You have this faith-filled church background, right? You've got this family who loves you and is embracing you. Pick up the story now. Like what what are the next steps here? Um, The next few years, life was still a process. Um, I attracted every loser boyfriend imaginable. I carried around just loads of guilt and shame. Um, And even if I wanted to inch back closer to church, I didn't trust the people within the church, and I figured they wouldn't trust me either. And what was that rooted in, Jan, when you think about, when you say that? I just didn't, what were you, like the Um, thought of going to church and getting help from the people there, you didn't really? Yeah, I really didn't want to be on everyone's prayer card, you know, and I figured if I already was that, People probably knew, and I don't know what the thought of church was, something more of perfection versus just mm. how we're all sinful, and yeah. yeah. That's good. All right, keep going. Yep. Um, so I just, kind of what I said, I ended up building just a barrier between yeah. myself and everyone else, and thought everyone was awful, and now I just realize we all get to be awful together, you know? We don't have to aspire to be something that we're not. Mm, That's good. And Kyle, what did you notice as a brother? Like, that neck, obviously your relationship, I'm sure, uh, went to a different place from that kind of experience together. I can only imagine the drive conversation and then some of the Mm -hmm. conversations after that. You want to just speak into that a little bit? I think when we got got back to our apartment, 
And I just naively expected her to be different when we got home. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. I had kind of some unrealistic expectations of that would um, all just wanting be to just, yeah. you know, force her to reconcile relationships and and you know, and I again, Megan was like, this, "You need to give her some time. Mm. This is going to be a process." And so, yeah, it just definitely is. Although that was a defining moment, it was definitely a process. There was a right. a long journey, and um, but because of us going through that together, um, it definitely strengthened our relationship, and yeah, it was really a blessing just to see her grow and become who she is called to be. Yeah, it's a great picture, I think, Jana. When we talk about one days, you know, one day is also it's an instantaneous where God kind of breaks through and breaks in. But your story is also it it. It's like a domino that moves into a process. Like you bring a one day fuels then a, a journey mm -hmm. for you, right? A process. Right. So why don't you speak a little, we're, we're 18 years removed from that one day phone call to Kyle. And shame, fear, anxiety, that's still a journey, right? You would say, talk about that and the journey and the process point that it's been and, and maybe speak to the things you found that have been helpful to you in the ongoing struggle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think realizing that feelings of guilt and shame and fear and anxiety, they are not from the Lord and they are not of the Lord. Um, I think feeling I'm never mommy enough, I'm not being a good wife enough, I'm not drinking my herbal tea and reading my how-to books before bed enough. Um, <laughs> I think my personal awareness that the enemy is real and ready doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. It just means I'm prepared and prayerful when it does. It's a shame awareness. That's what I'm calling it. I think shame is the ultimate identity thief. Um, shame awareness reminds me to ask myself, why am I feeling this way? What has triggered this feeling? Are there sin patterns that need to be broken? Is there confession that needs to be that needs to happen? Actions that need to change? Instead of stuffing and burying the shame, because the enemy will use that as a foothold. Mm -hmm. I think vulnerability is the antidote to shame. Shame tells us not to speak what we're fearful of or disappointed about. And vulnerability says speak it, bring it to life, because that will suck the power from the thief. And shame has the tricky ability of sneaking in at any moment. When Justin and I were dating and even engaged, I heard some stuff that came back around to us that we weren't spiritual enough to be engaged or married. And what that did was it brought me back to that young adult, Jana, the reckless Jana, um, and made me question my own spirituality. And maybe I will never recover from my past. Um, maybe this is just a consequence of my behaviors. Mm. When I start feeling shameful, I hear things like, you're a loser. You're not good enough. Um, you have nothing left to offer. But church, that is a lie from the pit of hell. I think when I choose to voice what I'm feeling to the Lord or a trusted friend, that allows the Lord an opportunity to speak directly to me or to speak through that person and just breathe life and truth in that circumstance and moment. Kyle, you want to speak to, like, seeing Jana grow up, basically, from that, even that phone call or slightly before that phone call to the young lady sitting before us here. I mean, you've seen an awful lot. You've got a front row seat to some things. Maybe just speak to what you've seen the Lord do in her and what you're so encouraged about when you look at the development God's built in her. Tell me all the wonderful things about me. <laughs> I feel like that's the portion we're going to. Well, I mean, she's, she's smart. She's funny. She's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And she's, um, from all my accounts, she's a great wife, a great mom, mm -hmm. um, great sister. And um, it's just been a huge blessing to have a front row seat to see yeah. it. And to watch her have her kids, you know, have her own kids and love them and um, raise them in the church. And and Justin, um, those two together, it's, I don't know, it's, I feel like I'm just blessed to be, to be in their family, so. How did how'd you feel about that, Jan? Did you like that? Well, I thought there'd be more, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. That's all right. You didn't, I don't have a note card. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, I, what I love about this story today, church, is Jana modeling for us the very journey that's been instrumental for her in breaking free from some of it. You know, vulnerability 
right? Did you hear that part of that story, right? So being able to just be honest about the broken places, maybe the more difficult places, is a big step, right? A huge step in seeing the power of shame and fear and anxiety, like broken. That power gets broken in that place of honesty and vulnerability and openness. So, Jan, I just, I thank you for your willingness to simply say, hey, this is who I am. This is a part of my story. Um, this is what God's brought me through. Uh, maybe just a closing word from you, just thinking about, um, there's a lot of folks who may be sitting here listening, maybe online, are going to click on this video at some point later as people forward it around. And what would you just want to say as kind of a, a closing word to perhaps a young person or someone in the young adult years who's right where you were and they listen to your story, like leave them with what, what would you want them to hear above everything else in that moment? I think just to take small acts of obedience. I think I don't have one scripture in mind that I cling to, but there are several I feel like that go back to just purely being obedient to the Lord and in those times and that there's small steps of obedience um, and that it might not be an overnight success story and that's okay. Yeah, it's good. You want to say a couple things about what's been on you and Kendra's heart, um, thinking about ministry to women and you want to start something in April. You want to say a couple things about what's coming and the yeah. opportunity for some more ladies to be in a deeper conversation with you on some of these subjects. Yeah, I'm really excited about this. I think Kendra is too. Um, we're going to do a four-week um, just women's study on different topics that kind of surround identity of women. Um, it's only four weeks. That's all we're asking from you. Um, from 7 to 8.15. Um, Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be scripture, a few questions, and then full discussion. So. And you're going to open it up to anybody, right? Young, anybody. old, married, single. Yep, right? absolutely. And they're just wanting to help facilitate in the lives of ladies, congregation. And so you're welcome to invite others to that. And dovetailing with it, Hunter Smith and I are going to do the same thing for men. So men are like, well, what about us, men? Well, we've got plenty of things to work through as well, right, men? So amen to that. So Hunter and I are going to do a men's gathering similar time. We're going to do, so we're going to start these on April 24th, the Wednesday after Easter, and we're going to run them through May 15th. We're going to do four Wednesday nights, the ladies together, the men together, and two, two separate rooms, obviously. We got different kinds of dialogues going on, but going to hit the same thing. Just talk about what it means to pursue Christ with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, no matter our background and story. Amen. Can we do that? And Janet, do you want to say, before we pray for you, do you want to talk about maybe a card you're going to flip over out oh. there? Tell them about your card you wrote down. And it um, says, do not throw up on stage. So I get to go turn it over, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're done. She said she has a one-day wall card out there, so don't throw up during my story or stuff. I said, well, we're done. You can pray. Go flip your card over. And, um, but I know on behalf of the whole congregation and all those who are joining us who aren't physically in the room, we're just so grateful for your vulnerability, transparency, willingness to simply be yourself. And we count it a privilege that you'd share your story with us today. Can we thank Jana for that? <laughs> Let me pray for you. Let's pray together. The team's going to lead us through. I think um, I told Justin when we were kind of putting the service together, I just feel like sometimes music helps moments like this. I think there's been an awful lot deposited in the last 10 minutes or so. And I just want you to, I know you have been, but just listen to the Spirit, what the Spirit's saying. Let the words of the song kind of minister into some places. Maybe it's hit home. Uh, there's some faces. I think it's, it's hit home pretty close. And so um, let's just trust, trust God to have his way um, with using this story and the ripple effect from it. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for Jana. Thank you for her life. Uh, thank you that you, you, King Jesus, began a good work in Jana way back in those younger years when when Fred and Sherry were praying and were opening God's word and were sitting at the dinner table and talking about life in the kingdom and taking her to church. And thank you for siblings like Kyle who just answer a phone call and say, yes, I'll come. Thank you for all the wonderful people. I think of the friends that you've inserted into her life, uh, people who've simply stepped in and said, Jana, follow me as I follow Christ. And here she sits. 
thank you for the woman she has become and continues to grow and we pray the fullness of your blessing on her and we pray for a ripple effect of resurrection life to break lord break the chains break the strongholds break the lies may truth and righteousness and holiness and goodness jesus jesus you get the last word so may you rise up and speak a living word through this story we pray in jesus name Amen. Open up your Bibles to John chapter 16 or pull out your message notes so you were hand on the way in or you can fire up your app. You can get them electronically there. Those joining us online, you can get them electronically there on the feed as well. Jana's story sets up so well a statement from Jesus in John 16. Because here, here's what Jesus, I entitled the message today, Good to Great. Because here's what Jesus, Jesus made the preposterous statement in John 16. Like we would have joined the disciples' response here like, verse 7, here's what it says. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Now wait, 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 wait a minute right there. (laughs) Now, Now there's nothing about that, that if you were with Jesus, if you're Peter, if you're James, if you're Mary, if you're Martha, and you've been hanging with Jesus, you've been having supper with Jesus, you've been going to prayer meetings with Jesus. Now some of you got some really great life groups, but if Jesus We're in your life group together, and he said in one of your life group gatherings, hey, it is for your good that I'm going to exit. Now listen, nobody would have been, you wouldn't, now there's some folks in your life group you might be happy to hear that from, but not Jesus, right? You would want him around. Jesus was the kind of person people wanted to be around. You wanted to be near him. He was right there with you. He says it's for your good. I'm going to leave. Now stay with me here. Unless I go away, the counselor, which is a term he uses for the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Do you track that, what Jesus is saying there? So long before Jim Collins, the great leadership writer, long before he coined the phrase good to great, Jesus actually gave us a spiritual good to great principle right here. He says, hey, as great as it's been to have me around physically, that it's going to be even better when I go from physical presence to physical absence, because when I exit, I'm going to send the Spirit. And right there, things that were so good with Him in bodily form are going to be even better with the Holy Spirit coming. And so, in the minds of the hearers there, the disciples and the Jews, they'd be thinking, you mean, you mean the spirit in Genesis 1 that's hovering over the waters? You mean the pillar of fire that led the Jews through the wilderness and across the Red Sea in Exodus 13? Do you mean that cloud that descended on the top of Mount Sinai? Do you mean the, the breath that breathed into the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel 37? Do you mean the Psalm 29 voice that shakes the deserts and twists the oaks and strips the forest? You mean that spirit that has come externally on the people of God, moving upon people and situations all through the century? You mean that spirit is going to become a personal indwelling presence if you exit? That's what Jesus is saying. And he says, as good as it is that you have me here, it's going to be great when I go because the Spirit's going to come. And when the Spirit comes, it'll take your breath away. So this morning, church, my main question to you is, do you know, do you know the Spirit? Are you seeking the Spirit? Because Jesus said, as good as it would be to have him like physically here, we have it even better Because we're on this side of what he's referring to now. He's trying to give them a preview of coming attractions, which we will be walking through in the Lenten season. So he's preparing them for Passion Week. He's preparing them for Palm Sunday, for Monday Thursday, for Crucifixion Friday, for Silent Saturday, for Resurrection Sunday. He's preparing them for that week. And then when he rises from the dead, he spends 40 days preparing them for what? He's going to exit. I mean, how great was it that Jesus was around? And then you get Jesus in his resurrected form like, oh my gosh, it doesn't get any better. You get resurrected Jesus in your life group. And he keeps saying, hey, I, I'm going to exit and it's going to be even better. Because then when he exit, the, the book of Acts opens up and says, right, the believers are all together and they're waiting. And what have Acts chapter 2, right? Fire from heaven, wind of the spirit. The spirit is poured out. And we're on this side of those events. So the church age is inaugurated by Jesus' exit and the Spirit's entry. 
And so this morning we're looking at, like, what does the Spirit do when he comes and inhabits a life and takes over a life? So I put three things in your notes that we're going to look at. Like, when the Spirit comes, what does he do? And the first one is he applies Christ's life to our lives. Have you heard that phrase, like, someone say to you, well, like, when Jesus came into my life, have you ever thought, how does that work? The Holy Spirit. How does Jesus come into someone's life? I opened my heart to Jesus. Have you heard that phrase before? Or I really sense Jesus is with me in this. Have you used that statement before? How how does that happen? The Holy Spirit. Like Jesus makes the statement at the end of Matthew 28 that he gives us these like commissioning orders. He gives us our marching orders as his followers. He says, you're going to go to the ends of the earth and you're going to teach and baptize and preach and proclaim in my name. You're going to tell everything that I've tried to teach you. You're going to do that to the ends of the earth. And he says, and I will be with you always. How? How? The Holy Spirit. That's how. Like when Jesus was physically on the earth, he couldn't be like in Jerusalem and in Joppa and in, you know, Nazareth. He couldn't be like physically in the same area all at the same time. But when he left and the Spirit was poured out, Acts chapter 2, now Jesus present today, approximately 190 nations, 2 billion people gathering in his name today, right now actively present with our 2 billion on this planet. How? Holy Spirit. The Spirit. This is why the Apostle Paul says it this way. Uh, Colossians 1.27, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Isn't that an amazing statement? Christ in you. How does Jesus live in you? Holy Spirit. How is Christ's life like shaping and forming and carving in you? How does that happen? How does someone become increasingly like Jesus, which is supposed to be the trajectory of the Christian life? The word Christian means little Christ. Like people are supposed to hang around us and see Jesus and his values and his attitude and his behavior and his decision. More of Jesus and more of us. That should be like the discipleship trajectory for anyone who's following him. Samuel Chadwick, the old pastor, the English pastor, said Christianity is hopeless without the Holy Spirit. Why did he say that? Because of this. Like we got no shot for Christ's life to be formed and shaped and walking with him without the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, when the Spirit comes. That's why he says it's so good that I've been with you, but it's going to be great when I come. And in our Alpha class on Wednesday nights, we've been looking at the role of the Holy Spirit. And it's been, I think, very fruitful for all of us involved with the class. And one teacher whom I didn't know even existed, I didn't know the Pope had a personal pastor. So here's a little clip from the Pope's personal pastor from Rome talking about the Holy Spirit. Jesus says that to to experience the Spirit is like to be born again. It's a a new birth. Uh, in the sense that everything becomes alive. Uh, The Holy Spirit doesn't change anything, and He changes everything. He He doesn't add anything to what Jesus has already said and instituted, but He makes all Jesus has has said and done alive today. But this is what the Holy Spirit is meant to be. Uh, The one who accomplishes, who realizes, who reenacted the work of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is a relationship, a person, a person. It's a personal love between God the Father and the the Son. And if human love can change the life of two people, imagine what does the Holy Spirit do with love in person. When he comes upon a person and when he, he is accepted, welcomed, uh, there can be a, 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 a more <clears throat> rewarding experience than to experience the Holy Spirit. Does he just have that kind of presence where you just want to like hang around him? Like he's, I just want to listen to him even more. But do you, do you get the personal, relational dynamic there? There's nothing like having a relationship with the Spirit. Jesus says it's great. And it's central to how Christ's life is applied to us. And the second part here is that the Spirit possesses the power to change. To change what is into what you long for it to be. Anybody come in this morning and just say, you know what? I'm going, I want to see some things change. 
I want to see despair moved into hope. I want to see grief and sadness moved into joy and expectation. I want to see addiction move to breakthrough. I want to see patterns that have been going this way, old ways. I want to see go a new way. And it's the Spirit that brings change. The Spirit brings the power to take what currently is and make it something different. It's the role of the Spirit. So church, do you see we have, to, we have to seek the Spirit? And as we seek the Spirit, it magnifies Jesus. Like what's the Holy Spirit about? The Holy Spirit is about shining a spotlight on Jesus. We'll get into this more next week, but a person who's, who's full of the Holy Spirit, you know, a marker for that person, they're consumed with Christ. They can't get enough of Jesus. That's a person full of the Holy Spirit. So are you seeking the Spirit? Are you consumed with Christ and His power to make all things new in your life? That whatever has been, whatever has marked, whatever has been dominant can change. Like we're we're crazy. It's, we, we have this crazy message, and we actually believe human beings can change. That's crazy. Like, we actually believe that. How? Holy Spirit. Spirit can break through. The Spirit can break in. It's Romans 8. We actually believe Romans 8, when Paul said, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. You know, Jana's story is a Romans 8 story. That's some of your stories as well. Probably a commentary on all of our stories. We're all Romans 8 stories. The places of sin and death, the things that were marked going this way, right? The Spirit comes. The Spirit of life brings life and freedom. He brings change. How? This is how it works. If you're going down the life and death road, the way you get off of that road onto a new road is the Spirit. He sends a Spirit to bring change. And it doesn't matter what we've wandered into. It doesn't matter how long we've wandered into it. You're ap- there's, you are not beyond the reach and the love and the strength of his love and grace to you. You're not dead. You're not done. You still got breath of life in your lungs. Here you sit. Someone listening, sitting somewhere, driving somewhere, and you just need to hear this. God's not done with you yet. He's still coming for you. The spirit is coming. And like the old English preachers used to say, he's got the hound of heaven. When he catches your scent, he will track you down. Just like that little hunting dog catches that scent, he will track you down. And perhaps today is another indication that he is tracking you down. And whatever has been law of the spirit of life right now, right, can set you free from the law of sin. And whatever's been sin and death can be marked, changed, and different. We believe that because of what Jesus said. I will send the Spirit, and the Spirit can make a change. So first thing is, the Spirit is what, how, like, how does Christ's life actually practically come to indwell, to inhabit a person? Holy Spirit. And then secondly, it's the Spirit that possesses the power to change what is to what you long for it to be. Maybe you've been whispering some prayers for what you long to see change in your life. You know, it's the Spirit that's the power to see that come about, the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, and we'll wrap with this, the Spirit is the fuel to press on when we want to quit. Well, have you noticed this with life? It, it, like, it's not easy. <laughs> life comes at you in some ways where at times you just want to cash in the chips. I mean, you just get to the point, like you can come off of a spiritual retreat, you can go to a conference, maybe a great worship service on a Sunday. Man, you can be on Sunday afternoon ready to just go at it into your week, and then Monday morning comes, right? Or Tuesday staff meeting, or Thursday PTA, whatever it is, and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, a long way away from whatever. I have this, well, I have a lot of idiosyncrasies, but I've got this one idiosyncrasy about when someone's not feeling well, I ask them, I said, well, they said, you know, my family will say to me, girls will say to me, or Kendra, hey, I'm not quite feeling well. I said, well, as a guy, it's not super helpful for me, the vague, like, I'm not feeling well. So I said, give me a percentage. Like, I, I need a percentage. Like, the staff knows this, right? So staff come in, and somebody on staff will say, ah, I'm not feeling well. And I say, well, what's the percentage? Oh, I'm like, oh, after they get over my idiosyncrasy. They know now. So everybody knows when they're, not, when they're sick around me, they, they know they got to be ready for, like, a percentage question, right? Oh, I'm 74% today. Oh, okay. See, what's real helpful is then tomorrow when I see them, right? So I see them the next day. I say, what percentage are you today? And they go, oh, I'm like 60%. Oh, we're, 
we're trending the wrong way right there. We got a little saying in our house, like when you get below 50%, oh, it's shutting it down. Like when you're below 50%, no school, no work. When you're below 30%, that's when you're texting Doc Benson, Doc Swinney, the folks in the car. Like you need to see physicians. Like you need serious attention. And we don't have any, we don't even have a marker for sub 30% on that. Kaylin just says, well, dad, I think that's when you die. That's what she told me. It's like, <laughs> but I thought about in the spiritual life, like, wouldn't it be helpful? Have you seen the five-hour energy commercial where it's the little, like, percentage, like your phone has the battery life above your head? Like, wouldn't it be super helpful, like, if you were just walking around the spiritual life, like, in community, if we just had a little, like, percentage, like, battery meter above our head? Like, how are we today? Now, it may not be super encouraging to a pastor on that, but I'm just, just imagine, like, I'm just imagining how encouraging it would be, like, to see right now just a display of, hopefully your lines are, like, into the green, not the yellow-red, Right? But isn't life a lot yellow and red? Like when that phone says, it's time to plug in and charge up. That's what happens in life. Do you know the mechanism for how we have endurance to just stay at it? You know, it's the Spirit. You seek the Spirit. Here's how Paul said it this way. He said, Colossians 1, To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. I caught the same bug that all of you have had over the last several weeks or months of this winter. I caught it this past week. I don't know how many times this week I said, Lord, just, I just need the energy of the Holy Spirit. He's so faithful to give that. Even if I wake up and say, I'm 65% today. I'm going to give you, Lord, I'm going to give you my best 65% I've got. I need the energy of the Holy Spirit. And he can meet you there. And when you get to those places where you feel like you're just about ready to cash your chips, and say, I don't know if I can put one more step in front of the other. Here's what I want you to lean. Lean into the Spirit. Seek the Spirit. It's not all on you and I's shoulders. He's got life to give, strength to give in those places of weariness. And one of my favorite quotes that kind of, for me, crystallizes the discussion this morning, Mark Buchanan's one of my favorite writers, and he wrote about our response to those places when we hit weary stretches, and there's like one way you go about is you just kind of, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, you just go kind of self-striving, suck it up, keep pressing, just go hard. That's one way to go about it. And then he said another way to go about it is to seek the Spirit, and I love how he outlined I, I put the quote in your notes because I think so highly of it. I thought it might be helpful. Here's how he summarizes it this way. Stay with me. It's a bit long here. The one who is all about discipline, control, and accountability. That's one way to respond, by the way, to when life's not going so great. You just more discipline, more control, more accountability. He's lean and sharp and focused. He gets more done, has fewer mess-ups, can quote with flawless accuracy, more scripture. He just lacks joy. His faith and virtue sour with each passing year. He struggles with judging others and hating himself, the twin offspring of self-striving. He nurses, I suspect, bitterness toward God. His children are mostly silent, but have watchful, distrustful eyes. Contrast that with the one who seeks the Spirit. He garbles Scripture and can never remember what passage comes from where. He bumbles and ambles at times. He is earthy in a way some people find shocking. He could lose a few pounds and sometimes forgets mid-sentence what he's talking about. He abounds, but he abounds with joy. He gets sweeter by the day. He is one of the few people I know who truly loves sinners and hates sin. And people instantly sense it. They sense they're safe with him. His love for God is as inviting as a blue lagoon and contagious as laughter, and he is his children's hero. Gang, I want to be a whole lot more like paragraph two there. That was the markers of one who seeks the Spirit. Let's be a people who seek the Spirit. To have his life pulsating in our lives, to have our children rise up and call us blessed. You say, well, why does it have to be so hard? I suspect a big part of why the stretch is so hard in this walk is it just breeds this raw dependence on God. Like sometimes the ingredients that we're battling through in life, some of you going through the, the body fading away or things at home fading away or career fading away or faith and ministry stuff, fading, you get these fading away things going on. I say, right there in that space, it just like, thrusts us into raw dependence, and raw dependence is the raw material from which God does some of his best work, and some of his best work right there is seek the Spirit. And perhaps we come to the end of ourselves and say, I just can't power through this anymore in my own wisdom and strength, and right there's that place where you seek the Spirit. 
So worship team, come on up. Here's how we're going to wrap up this morning. I want to just create a little space during our closing song. The song's entitled, Give Me Faith, and it's kind of a, I want you to think of the lyrics as maybe being sung into some of us this morning, perhaps. And I just want to open up the front here for some of you who maybe have come this morning and, and perhaps it's something really resonating in your heart from Jana's story. Maybe you're in a, a Romans 8 place, right? Maybe you look at it and go, I'm on, the road, I'm on the wrong road going the wrong way. And today needs to be a day of change. You know, sometimes we've got to do some stuff with our physical body to help reinforce what the Spirit's saying. And so that's what these prayer benches are here for you. You come, you kneel, you pray, and just maybe a sense of, could be that point of surrender, just changing roads, it could be that you're, you want to give your heart to Christ. Maybe there's someone here who just says, you know what, I've heard all about Jesus, but today it's got to get personal, and I want to give my heart to Christ, because it's only a person who surrenders to Jesus who has the Holy Spirit living within them. The Holy Spirit can be at work around us, can be nudging us, can be directing us. That's definitely the Spirit's role, but the Spirit comes to live with inside the person who surrenders to Jesus. And maybe that's for you this morning. It's a surrender to Jesus moment, perhaps. Or maybe, you know, maybe you're in this place where it, it's time for some stuff to change. And you know it. You need the power to change. You're at the end of yourself. So I can't change what needs to change. Spirit can come. And you come and seek the Spirit and say, Jesus, I need you to change some things. You need to give me power and strength beyond myself. Or perhaps you're here this morning and the everydayness of life has just left you weary. You're simply right on the edge of exhaustion tired and you want to come and kneel and say Lord I just need energy of the Holy Spirit I'm yellow light red light on the power thing I need you to come and give me strength beyond myself and at the core of it we believe this that as good as it would be for Jesus to be physically present to come and pray with us as we come and kneel It's even better that he's absent because he sends a spirit. And you can come and seek the spirit and he can be present and personal and active in these moments. Let's pray together. Jesus, we just give you this time now. We just pause. We just want to be responsive to what you're doing, Holy Spirit. You see every heart right where we are and what we need. Say, come, Spirit of the living God, come.